Good morning, everyone. And I want to say good morning to those listening online, and also um, good morning to Lincoln and Grundy Center. If you were here last weekend, you heard Doug kick off this series called Transforming Friendship. We believe here at Orchard Hill Church that God has us as a church on a journey toward understanding the potential power of transforming friendships in our lives. Now, transforming is a bit of a big word, isn't it? How many of you would think it would be comfortable to say to somebody, would you be my transforming friend? That would be awkward, wouldn't it? That probably wouldn't go very well. But by transforming, we simply mean intentional friendships meant to help those involved grow in faith and in love. There's this beautiful Proverbs, Proverbs 27, 17, that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. That's the kind of friendship we're talking about. And we're at the very front end as a church of our thinking on this here. How do we help each other with our busy lives grow in community? And especially, how do we help each other grow in these specific kinds of friendships. So we're going to spend three weeks exploring this. Doug was here last week, really urging us strongly to think hard about this aspect of our lives. And, you know, as I listened to him and I thought about my teaching and what Tim's going to bring, I realized for some of us, this series is going to be very encouraging. And for others of us, the topic of this series might poke at some old wounds or even bring to the surface some current loneliness right now we'd rather not think about. And for others of us, I think this series might convict us in some ways that we've gotten lazy about some of our our friendships. So I want to start this morning and and, and thinking about what I'm going to talk about by asking you this question. What trait or quality is just in you? It's just been a part of you for the longest time, something that just is part of how God made you. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to tell you a couple, a couple stories related to that. Uh, Chuck has been hunting with my dog, Stella, lately. Now that our three kids are gone, we only have a dog to talk about, so you're going to hear a lot of Stella stories, I'm afraid, until Chuck and I get a lot more interesting. But Chuck's been hunting, duck hunting, with Stella lately, and he loves to come home like a proud father and tell me amazing things. And he especially loves stories about things Stella does just because she's a Labrador retriever. So his favorite story recently has been the story of him shooting a duck, which I find horrible. Duck's just flying along. Chuck shoots it dead. It drops down into the pond. And then he says Stella's name and she leaps off the blind and she swims out toward the dead duck. But midway through her swim, she got wrapped up in another decoy, a duck decoy that has a rope attached to it, and she had to drag this whole duck decoy, the whole hundred yards to get the dead duck, drag the whole decoy, it was trapped on her back leg, all the way back to the blind. Now most dogs, if they had any common sense, would stop their swimming and try to get this thing, this 10 or 15 pound thing off her back leg, not Stella. She just retrieved the duck no matter what, proudly placed that dead duck at Chuck's feet. She was doing what is just in her to do, and she would not be stopped. That's enough about my dog. Let's talk about me for a minute. (laughs) I have something that I do when I teach or even when I just talk that is just in me. I don't even think about it. I just do it. Anybody want to take a guess? Don't say it out yet. Just a minute. For another clue, watch this video for a sec. It's quick. Okay, that's good. Yikes. I especially like this one. I don't know what I... Anybody want to take a guess? Hands, right? The teaching team has been kind of watching little clips of ourselves and evaluating each other to help encourage each other and to help us grow. And so there was this topic of me using my hands, and there was some discussion about me maybe having more thoughtfulness to my hand mo. And I just thought to myself, you can tell me that all you want, guys, but I'm just always going to do whatever my hands want to do. It reminds me of uh, Talladega Nights, Ricky Bobby. 
I, do, I don't know what to do with my hands. Anybody remember that one? Now, okay, take a deep breath. <clears throat> why did I show you this? And why did I stop to ask you to think about what is just in you? It's because our desire for community, our desire for friendship, for relationship, is just in us. Because of how we were created and by whom we were created. Pastor John Ortberg says, the yearning to attach and to connect, to love and to be loved is the fiercest longing of the soul. This is true because you and I were created in the image of God. And God is a three-in-one community, a trinity. And God has existed in this form, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for all eternity. And we have an innate desire to be in relationship because we image our Father. Now, for human beings to try to explain or even think about the Trinity, which is one of the central and deepest mysteries of our faith, is always a bit ridiculous. Uh, British writer uh, G.K. Chesterton, I think, explained it really well. He says, we cannot explain God because our heads are too little and our brains are too feeble to accommodate him. Isn't that true? Nevertheless, he said, if we're to live in any orderly manner, We must have some kind of orderly thinking about God. It helps us to try to understand God. And so humans have developed the theology of the Trinity, which is simply our best human effort to put words to the eternal mystery that is God. The doctrine of the Trinity, which flows out of our understanding of Scripture, means that connectedness, Community is at the heart of the reality into which we were born and into which we will spend eternity. God is community. Dallas Willard put it this way. He said, the Trinity is a self-sufficing, and all that means is that it's self-sufficient. It doesn't need anything else. The Trinity is a self-sufficing community of unspeakably magnificent personal beings, of boundless love, knowledge, and power. That is the God we worship. We were designed in the image of that God who lives in eternal, creative, humble, joyful, giving, holy community, Father, Son, and Spirit. God is one, yet God is three. God is three, and God is one. In the Gospel of John, we read at the very beginning these famous words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. The season we're about to enter into and dwelt among us. Jesus says in that same Gospel, the Gospel of John, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. We learn that the Father loves the Son and calls him beloved and tells the world how pleased he is with him. The Son loves the Father and only does what the Father tells him to do and only speaks the words the Father gives him to speak. At the same time, the Father glorifies the Son, but the Son also glorifies the Father. The Father sends the Spirit who testifies about Jesus, who convicts the world of sin and reminds us of Jesus' words. The Father gives all authority in heaven on earth to the Son. The Spirit points to the Son, and the Son says to human beings, it's better for you that I go away so that the Spirit will come and be with you. This is just a sampling of the scriptural truths that point to the reality that the Trinity is a beautiful, selfless, humble, other-centered dance of Father, Son, and Spirit. And it is a dance you and I were created to join. And it is a dance of relationship we were created to image to the world. God did not create us because he was lonely. He created us because he is a community of love and he wanted a world full of creatures to join in. As Meister Eckhart says, he's a German theologian, we were created out of the laughter of the Trinity. That is our origin. 
And so our invitation from Jesus is not just to be in relationship to him, just Jesus and me. No, we have ultimately been invited for eternity right into the heart of the fellowship of the Trinity. This is mind-blowing stuff. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, this beautiful prayer. And he says this, he says, he's praying to his father, my prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about his disciples. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That is us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. May they, meaning us, may they also be in us. This is the most important offer of friendship of all. But at the same time, the truth of the matter about us is that we need other human beings to help us live into our friendship with God. Doug talked about it last week. We can't do it on our own. We were not created to do it on our own. We need iron sharpens iron kind of friends. Which reminds me of my friend Pam who has literally been my walking partner for the last 17 or 18 years. We can never quite remember. She and I have walked five miles together, rain, snow, sleet, hail, whatever else might come our way, 5.45 in the morning, two or three times a week for almost two decades. Pam and I met in the dark, in the street, and we walked five miles. I figured out the other day, I did the math, that we walked between 11 and 12,000 miles. I told Chuck that, and he immediately started to scribble down his own math, which made me very mad at him. (laughs) But he said I was right. He couldn't believe it, and I'm like, do the math, which I loved saying to him. I'm like, just do the math, Chuck. (laughs) 11 or 12,000 miles, and Pam and I were very clear that we wanted a friendship that at its core would be about deep spiritual encouragement. Now, this does not mean we did not have just a great, normal friendship. We laughed our heads off together. Pam was the friend who was with me on the morning we walked our two dogs, both now deceased. May they rest in peace. Um, When I picked up my dog's business with my Target bag, wrapped it in a nice little bow, and thought I was going to just toss the bag toward her house so she could pick it up on her way home. But if you'll recall, I launched that bag just a little too high on my release point, and up it flew, and, and it hooked on a tree in the nicest landscaped yard in our neighborhood. And Dr. Davis, he's a surgeon, Dr. Davis's tree, there that bag of poop hung all day. I, we fell down in the street and laughed so hard, and then she's the friend who noted when it fell down and called me and said, the eagle has landed, and then she... <laughs> She went and got, she went and picked that up for me. She's the kind of friend who one morning her dog Jake wasn't with her and she said, I think Jake's dead, Alice. Come, come see if he's dead. I'm like, really? She made me crawl into poor, he was old, so don't be too sad, but he was like 17 year old hunting dog. She made me crawl into his doghouse in the dark and poke him. I'm like, yep, he's dead, all right. We cried together. Over life's rough stuff, we talked in the dark about everything. About marriage, kids, work, family, death, parents, clothes, weight gain, recipes, everything. But we knew in the end that our primary purpose was to be iron sharpens iron kinds of friends. The kind of friends who say to each other in word and in deed, don't lose heart. Don't lose your faith. Don't despair. Don't be afraid. We reminded each other of God's grace and of God's unconditional love for each each other. But Pam moved out to the country this fall, and I lost my walking partner. And there are some mornings that I feel lonely. And loneliness is painful. And I believe it's painful because our desire for friendship, for connectedness, is just in us. We are creatures made in the image of God, and loneliness cuts us off from what we were created out of and what we were created for. Loneliness is painful. You know, it's the one thing God pointed to in his creation story 
and said that that's not good when Adam was alone. George Gallup of the Gallup Association, who takes all the polls, said Americans are the loneliest people in the world. And you know what scientists are discovering? They're discovering that loneliness is not just sad, but it's killing us. Imagine if more than half of us in here this morning were smoking cigarettes as you were listening to me and as we were singing, cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. We would probably, starting next week, have a long teaching series, wouldn't we, about the dangers of smoking for our lives. Scientists have discovered what they call the lethality of loneliness. They've discovered that loneliness is lethal. It is ranked by scientists as high a risk risk factor for mortality, a.k.a. dying, as smoking. This is a part of the reason we're teaching this and a big part of the reason we have transforming friendship as one of our five-year themes. We believe God cares deeply about this. As of 2004, think about, these statistics were very shocking to me. In in 2004, the average American had just two close friends. Compared to, in 1985, the average American had three close friends. Those reporting no confidants at all, no best friends, jumped from 10 in 1985 to almost a quarter of Americans in 2004. That was almost 10 years ago. So in a more recent poll... Uh, by the AARP, where they surveyed adults 45 and over, which can I just say, since I am in that age range, AARP, don't be reaching down into my age group. Stay up there 55 and over. You can't just all of a sudden decide 45 and over. I was a little bit perturbed by that, but I felt I needed to say that. So they studied adults in America 45 and over, slightly more than one out of three adults, that's about 35% of Americans, report being chronically lonely, which means they've been lonely for a long time. And a decade earlier, in 2000, only one out of five, about 20% of Americans said that. So it's jumped 15% in a decade. Loneliness is becoming kind of an epidemic. I've been lonely. And I bet every single one of you have been lonely or is lonely right now. And part of why it hurts so much is that we were created for so much more. Loneliness is not our fault. It's it's a part of the human condition. Even Jesus, at some of his most crucial moments, was deserted by his best friends and he felt alone. King David was lonely. There's a beautiful psalm, Psalm 25, where David writes, Turn to me and be gracious to me, God, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. We should never assume that we're the only lonely one in a crowd. Literally, one out of every three people you meet is lonely as well. And for those of us who are lonely, one of the most important things we can start to do today is to pray for and to seek out transforming spiritual friendships with and through the people around you. We can do this. The church should be a place of rich and deep relationship. But you and I play a role in making that happen. And one thing that most of us need to do, I believe, is to first make peace with one of the most important people in our lives. Have you ever thought about who it is that you will spend eternity with besides God? Have you ever thought about the one person that you can be 100% confident you will be with forever and ever? The one person You better be about making friends with now because you will never be free of this person ever. Anybody want to take a guess? Yes? Amazing. Yourself. From the mouth of babes. Here's the truth. You are going to be with yourself for all eternity. I'm sorry if that's news to some of you. (laughs) 
Don't you think it will simply go better if you make peace with yourself now? If you decide to treat yourself as Jesus does? See, some of us on this journey toward transforming friendship need to first of all make friends with ourselves. Chuck sometimes says to me, so-and-so really likes you. They met you at a party or they met you downtown or whatever. You know what my first reaction is? Now that's because they don't know me. Then we both laugh and we think that's so funny. But, but listen to what I'm revealing. Don't I need to give God a bit more credit than that? He created me. He loves me. He calls me to join his eternal community. Brennan Manning who writes about this a lot, said one of the most shocking contradictions in Christian living is the intense dislike many disciples of Jesus have for themselves. Now where in the world did we get the idea that not liking ourselves was a part of God's plan? And why do we think that's okay? Jesus said there were two great commandments. All the other commandments rest on these two. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love neighbor, love self. It almost begs the question, how can I love my neighbor if I don't love myself? Any of you who took Psychology 101 know of Carl Jung. He was a psychiatrist who had a tortured relationship with Christianity. But he wrote these very compelling words. He said, what if I should discover that the least of the brothers of Jesus, the one crying out most desperately for reconciliation, forgiveness, and acceptance, is myself? What if I should discover that I myself stand in need of the alms of my own kindness, that I myself am the enemy who must be loved? What then? Will I do for myself what I do for others? See, too many of us refuse to befriend ourselves and then wonder why we have a hard time making friends. Eleanor Roosevelt put it, Quite succinctly, she said, friendship with oneself is all important because without it, one cannot be friends with anyone else in the world. So what does it mean? And I think this is where Christians get nervous because we think it means that we're completely self-absorbed then. But really, being a friend to myself doesn't mean that at all. In fact, it may be the only way to stop being so self-absorbed. Being my own friend really means I get over myself. I stop spending so much mental energy beating myself up for being human. It means I accept myself for who God made me to be. His masterpiece says that's what we are right in Ephesians. Unique, nobody else like me, but also broken, fallen, and sinful, but worthy of redemption. Befriending myself doesn't mean I go around talking about myself all the time or bragging or always just pursuing my own selfish pleasures. It means I know my flaws. I come to peace with my weaknesses just as I come to peace with my friends' weaknesses and I stop taking myself so bloody seriously. I know I'm loved. I'm invited into God's eternal friendship circle so I can stop disliking myself. I can start to be my own friend. I can declare a truce and the war can be over. And what happens then is that my capacity for friendship with others grows. I think, I think Brennan Manning, who recently died, who was a ex-Catholic priest, alcoholic, struggling, but brilliant man. I think he struggled with this himself because so many of his books contain writing about this issue. But this is what he said. He said, my degree of compassion for others depends on my capacity for self-acceptance. 
When I am most unhappy with myself, isn't this true? I am most critical of others. When I am most into self-condemnation, I am most judgmental of others. He said, if, if I'm going to live for other people, I must be able to live with myself. And he said that loving myself frees me up to love other people. So can, can I just say for those of us who struggle with this issue, for some of us, the most important thing we can do in order to begin to live out God's plan for loving, transforming friendship is to make friends with ourself. Maybe you could go home this afternoon and write yourself a little note and pass it to yourself over lunch. Will you be my friend? Yes, no, maybe. Check a box. And if some of you checking maybe might be a step in the right direction. Jesus said to his disciples before he went to the cross, you are my friends if you do what I command. And my command is this, love each other. We were created, you and I, out of the laughter and the love of the Trinity. We were created for relationship with God and relationship with each other and relationship with ourselves. And here's the beautiful circular nature of this whole deal. I can't be friends with myself truly until I accept God's invitation through Christ into his loving community. I can't be friends with other people truly until I am friends with myself. And yet I need others to help me be friends with God and to help me be friends with myself. We can't do this alone. We need each other. We need transforming friendship in our lives. And so we want to find ways here at Orchard to encourage and support and validate and help transforming friendships in our midst to flourish. It is something people inside and outside the church are desperate for. And so our five-year journey as a church family on this topic begins. Gary Collins, who's a psychologist, said, America is a loneliness-creating country. But we at Orchard want to be a loneliness-ending church. Let's pray. Father, you are good, and you are beautiful, and you are mysterious to us. That you exist in eternal community blows our mind. And even further, that you invite us into that is amazing to us, but we can't do it alone, God. You created us to need each other. So help us, each one of us this morning, wherever we are on this journey, to take one step of faith toward developing, transforming friendships in our own lives. We thank you that you empower that within us, God, and we love you. Amen.